You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. What's spooky with you? When Frank Costanza died. Again? I had stumbled upon ME theory a couple of years before this, totally by accident, just hopping around on Wikipedia as you do, so I was already familiar with the idea. Like a lot of people, I remember the Bernstein Bears and New Zealand being further north. I think the whole phenomenon is kinda silly and ridiculous, but undoubtedly creepy and I find it really fascinating. Anyway. Last year, when the news broke that Jerry Stiller had passed away, I was eating breakfast with my then-boyfriend. He saw the headline on his phone and said, Holy shit, Jerry Stiller's dead. To which I replied, Yeah, since, like, 2005. He then showed me the article, Jerry Stiller dies at 92, May 11, 2020. Which I thought had to be some kind of mistake. I mean... I would have bet every dollar I owned with 100% certainty that man had been dead for 15 long years up until that very moment. I have vivid memories of hearing about him passing away when I was 14 or 15 years old, and it was a big deal in my house at the time. Both my parents were huge King of Queens fans. I mean, I don't fully understand their obsession with that show, but back in the day, it was like their favorite thing in the universe. And when he died, I distinctly remember how bummed they were over it. I even remember them having a conversation about what they thought was going to happen with the show with him suddenly being gone. And I remember the announcement that came later on that it was only getting one more season with fewer episodes so they could wrap things up for the fans, but they didn't want to keep the series going longer than that without Jerry Stiller's character. I remember there being some speculation about Ben Stiller taking it hard, because he was churning out box office hits left and right in the years just before, and then his career sort of slowed down a bit after his father passed. And on top of that, literally every time I'd see him playing Frank Costanza while watching Seinfeld, or any time I saw Ben Stiller in anything and was reminded of his dad for 15 whole years of my life, Without fail, something in the back of my head would always think, that's sad, he's dead. And then, out of absolutely nowhere, I swear to God, he died a second time. I googled it last year to see if anyone else had experienced the same Mandela effect and found nothing. As far as I knew, I was the only one. I just googled it again as I was writing this, and now there are a few other people recalling stories about it too. I have no idea why I remember these things happening if they never happened, and I don't know why Jerry Stiller's death is suddenly distorted for me out of all of the other random-ass things in the universe. It's not like I'm some die-hard Jerry Stiller fanatic or he had any profound impact on my life. It's just one of those things, I guess. Welcome back to Paranorm Girl. I'm your host, Kristen. Thank you all so much for tuning in. You make a girl feel pretty. You like me. You really like me. <sighs> Lies. Well, you might actually like me. Thanks so much. I like you too. You guys are cool. But no, not talking about that part. Do you all remember this part in Sally Field's Oscar acceptance speech? You like me. You really like me. You do. I do too. I would have given you someone's right nut. I was so sure that's what she said. But no, no. We continue to live in the upside down. Black is white, right is left, but also wrong. But because we're in the upside down, it's also right. What is going on? No, 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 no. What she actually said was, I can't deny the fact that you like me. Right now, you like me. That's 
what she said. Is it life-altering, world-shattering? Is it ever going to make a difference in somebody's life? You never know, but it's doubtful. But this is the sneaky part of the Mandela effect, and possibly why no one takes it seriously. Because for the most part, these changes are incredibly small. A couple different words in a speech, one letter in the name of a children's book. Okay, let's say for argument's sake that things are different from the way they used to be. So what? What difference would or does it make? I guess that all depends on what these small differences mean. Are they evidence of different timelines, parallel universes, some shift in the fabric of our reality? And furthermore, what caused it? That could be important and have bigger implications down the road. CERN and their Hadron Collider. Just gotta find the God particle, don't we? Can't just leave well enough alone. Or are we in a simulation? These glitches in the Matrix are literally glitches in the Matrix. I think it's worth talking about. I think it's worth learning about. Throughout this season, we're going to run the gamut, covering as many of these suckers as we can possibly fit in. And trust me when I say, even the most staunch skeptics among you may be surprised to learn that you too remember something that never happened. You might end up walking away from this season feeling a bit lied to, not right, just off, like you're an outsider looking in. It's not guaranteed you'll feel this way. I'm just saying you might think that you are right. You know what you remember, but they're going to keep telling you that you're wrong. It didn't happen that way. It's going to make you feel like you don't belong here. You must be from somewhere else. And let's say that was true. How do we get back home? E.T. Phone home. Except that that's not the line. It's E.T. Home phone. Same sentiment, though. Ooh, if you like movies, <laughs> I've got some awesome trivia for you. This is one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. You ready? What if I told you that Morpheus never said the line, what if I told you? Like, ever. In any of the Matrix movies, it's not in the script. How the hell did that line launch a thousand memes? How? Do you not even hear his voice saying those words? Okay. Whew. And calming down now. The next two we're going to talk about were big ones for me. I literally would not believe the person who was telling me what they actually were. Had to look these up because I did not believe it. Fruit of the Loom and Febreze. If you guys are already aware of these, then you might be feeling my frustration and pain right now. Like, I'm currently staring at a side-by-side -side of the Fruit of the Loom logo. A correct one and a not correct one. The brightly colored bunch of fruit is fine. It's just fine. Those remain the same in my mind. But one of these images contains a cornucopia nestled behind the fruit, and one does not. You know that this logo has never contained a cornucopia. Like, not even prior to a logo upgrade or as a, as a deviation on their trademark. No, no, it's just been the fruit. It's always just been fruit, apparently. So why, then, does the picture with that little basket bastard look so correct to me? And why does the supposedly right one just look wrong? The only possible explanation I can think is this. As a kid... I remember seeing this logo. Uh, my mother, my brother, and myself would go shopping for his new, you know, whatever, tidy whities And I remember seeing these packages. They, they look fun, you know, to a kid. The, the colorful cartoon fruits, uh, they, they make them seem desirable in my young mind. Well, as a child, I also recall Thanksgiving being an incredibly important holiday. We would spend days drawing out our little hand-shaped turkeys, learning about pilgrims and being thankful for stuff. And one of the images I would see, I remember seeing over and over again, was like uh, cartoon fruits and vegetables in and around a cornucopia in the middle of a pilgrim and native Thanksgiving table, right? 
just curious, uh, do I have any listeners with grade school age children right now? Uh, can someone please message me to confirm whether schools are still pushing the romanticized Thanksgiving garbage? I think we've all been enlightened enough to know that anytime the Native people agreed to meet on white people's terms, it always ended horribly for them. Can we just, can we, can we agree Thanksgiving didn't go that way, right? Oh, ooh, speaking of making garbage smell nice, Febreze. Spell Febreze out in your mind. Imagine how it looks in your head and then spell it out. F-E-B-R-E-E-Z-E is not correct. Too many E's, my dears. This one, I do understand how I could have misremembered the spelling. Um, I see that one might automatically want to spell the breeze part just like you would spell breeze. My question is, why did the company choose not to spell it that way? Y'all went round and about in the hard way just to be kind of creative, and then you didn't even onomatopoeia correctly, so I, I don't know. Uh, this Mandela effect's on you guys. Okay, next up, fellow Americans. This one is for you. I know that most of us gotta be familiar by now with the image of Uncle Sam, right? If you picture that I want you poster in your mind, can you paint a pretty clear picture of what he looks like, what he's wearing? Think about it. He's staring at you, pointing his big finger at you, white shirt, blue coat, and he's wearing this big hat. In your mind's eye, can you remember how the hat was designed and what color it was? And this one might be kind of hard to just imagine. Um, it's a very old image and not something that we see every day. I know. Uh, this might be one you've, you've got to go look up online. Just go into Google, uh, type in Uncle Sam Mandela Effect, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, I'll explain it right now, but you might not think it's off until you can see it for yourself. So the Uncle Sam hat that I remember was white and red striped with this blue ribbon around the base with white stars. The currently accepted version is almost the same, except there are no red stripes covering the hat. The actual hat is just, it's just white with that blue ribbon around the bottom. It doesn't sound like that big of a difference. I know, that's why I'm telling you, go check it out for yourself. All right, what, uh, what did I have left I wanted to talk about today? Oh yes, a point of contention, a real cover-up. And it involves no other than shady, corporate, black helicopter driving, pizza parlor owning Disney. That's right. They're trying to keep Tinkerbell silent, but they won't win. They won't. We're on to them. <sighs> I was surprised, actually, at how mad people online were getting over this one. So let me set the scene for you. You pop a Disney movie into the player. The screen opens up onto a blue background. Tinkerbell appears, zips around the castle, and with a couple taps of her wand, she draws the Disney name out in front. And when her wand doesn't quite dot the eye, fritzing out on her, she smacks it a couple times on her hand or part of the castle, and shazamo, she's able to dot the eye. Aside from a couple of small variations on this that I've read online, I do actually remember watching something like this. And here's the deal. Knowing how common this one actually is, it shouldn't be surprising that so many are upset. Just like as with many other Mandela effects, until you yourself believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that something happened and in a certain way, but continue to be told it did not, I'm not sure you're going to understand the anger. But rest assured, by the end of this season, you will. I will get at least one ah hell no out of my complete skeptics listening. So let's take a second to really inspect this one before we call it a wrap today. Uh, theories and explanations for this particular memory abound across the internet. Some think it's a mix-up between the regular Disney movie intros and the Disney TV intros. I personally cannot say one way or the other if that could be true, as up until researching this season, I had never specifically watched any Disney TV intros. But it's entirely possible that in all of my years of screen time, it possibly slipped into my subconscious somehow. But 
also, doesn't she only ever, like, draw out the Mickey Mouse head shape? Like, I, I haven't seen one yet where she's spelling out any words. So that, that part's kind of weird. There was also supposedly a late night Disney programming back in the 80s. And this would have been before any sort of Disney channel. Someone described this when they commented on one of the numerous videos trying to debunk the Tinker Mandela effect on YouTube. Um, that may very well be true and absolutely explain how so many of us have this memory and can so easily mix it up with the movie intros of our childhoods if we were in fact born just previous to that in the 80s, as I was. I also have no recollection of seeing this particular airing, but it's a possibility, of course, as to how I could have this Tinker intro memory. Someone also posted a copy of a very old version of a Tinker intro. Um, it's, it's either an intro or it could be a commercial from the looks of it. And by old, we talk in like in black and white. It appears very 70s-ish. The poster of this video posited that it was yet another mix-up of different versions and people's brains just pulling what they want from them all. The problem with this one, though, is that a ton of people clearly recount their memory in full color. And Tinker is doing a lot of different actions that are not included in the older commercials or intros. And then, of course, the problem you have of thousands of people remembering this effect happening essentially the same way, which cannot seem to be tracked down as an actual recording anywhere. Now, it seems like some supporters of the Mandela effect do need to slow their roll a little bit, as I've seen forums and websites claiming that there are zero versions of the Disney movie intros with Tinkerbell in them, that it's just the White Castle appearing on the blue background with Walt Disney spelled out in front. Obviously, this is not true, as many can recount Tinkerbell versions of the intro back during the days of VHS and back during the days of Betamax. And there are literally recordings of these exact versions posted to YouTube. So without going through Disney's archived microfish films to support this claim, let's just all agree for the sake of everyone's sanity that yes, of course, there have been older versions of this intro that have been updated throughout the years. But you gotta admit that even though there have been these updated versions over the commercials of the 70s, the late night show of the 80s, the swath of Disney movies over the 90s, the actual Disney Channel of the early 2000s, and the whatever the hell is going on over at Disney right now. Don't we all find it just a little strange that this very particular version of the intro does not seem to exist anywhere aside from within the memories of thousands? Forever imprisoned, so it should seem. That's going to do it for today, folks. Real quick, I wanted to briefly give a special shout out and thanks to my friend Ms. Erin Carrera over on the School for Heroines show. She was so incredibly kind and thoughtful recently to have me on as her guest. I had a great time chatting with her about the early evolution of Paranorm Girl and paranormal stuff in general. And of course, we talked up this season's topic, Mandela Effect. Uh, I posted about the interview back when it aired, but if you weren't able to catch that live, never fear. They now have it loaded up and ready to play on the podcast platforms. If you like it and want to hear more, you can absolutely subscribe over on the Her channel and check out their station and all of the other paranormal and spiritual and female empowering stuff they do over there at 12radio.com. If you love the paranormal and supernatural, you definitely will have a home over there. And of course, please remember to join me over at the Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at at Paranorm Girl Pod. Also, I'm so glad to say that I am no longer in need of any more glitch or Emmy personal accounts. Uh, I I'm all filled up for the rest of the season. So thank you so, so much to those who submitted. Your stories are outstanding, and I cannot wait to share them with everybody. Um, however, my door is always open, and if you have anything else to say or add to the current conversation, any questions or points you would like to make about this season's topic, you can send all of that over to paranormgirlpod at gmail.com. 
If you are liking this season and our purpose so far, please shout us out with a review and a rating. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And now, dear listeners, you know it's time for your final note. I seemed to have picked for the new season yet another contentious topic to pull apart and piece together. There are some seriously strong convictions about what this all is and isn't out there. Let me just throw a question out. Who are you saving with your righteous convictions? Whether you support the Mandela effect being quite real or not, who are you saving? Because to hear some demand that everyone needs believe what they believe, otherwise you're either stupid or crazy, when they themselves don't have a clue, it's kind of weird, man. It doesn't make sense to me to not continue the discussion, to learn no more about it. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, though. Can't imagine y'all would still be hanging out if we didn't agree even at just a basic level that this stuff needs to be explored, needs to be talked about, poked at, examined. And it's fun learning all this crazy new stuff right alongside everyone else. I personally don't know what's going on here. At this very early stage in the game, I don't even think I know. But something is taking place. Unlike with shadow people, however, I'm going to be much more comforted if I come to a largely rational conclusion. If it really is just us misremembering, somehow. Because I've taken an early peek into the alternate theories of what this is and what it can mean, and it gets scary, folks. I'm hanging off the edge of Occam's razor here for the time being. Unfortunately, that grip might get a little loose as we explore Mandela Effect residue on one of the upcoming episodes and talk about why this effect has got so many questioning their very realities. So did Tinker's wand fritz out on her? Did she get upset and give it a couple smacks? Or is my memory deceiving me? How about yours? Is it more likely that such a large group of people have this shared memory due to the way our brain fits together old commercials, alternate versions, and the like? Or did it really happen this way, but no one, not one person, thought to save it to VHS? I'm not sure. It sucks that we have to ask ourselves, do I really know what I think I know? What is the scarier realization? That memory is so damn fragile that we can never truly trust what we remember? Or that we can? Stay safe, guys. Keep that nightlight on. Sleep with one eye open.